Welcome here, everybody. We got another amazing episode. Got the privilege of having Russell Westcott on with us today. He'll be sharing with us a wealth of knowledge of his experience in the real estate and real estate investing world. How are you doing today, Russell? Wow. Amazing episode, man. So I didn't talk about setting the bar really high, my brother. Maybe maybe we'll wait yeah. till the end of our conversation to, to, to determine if it is amazing. But but I will do my best to deliver as much as I can in a short period of time. And I hope everybody has a pen and paper because I, I get when I get cooking, you know, things get almost combustible here a bit. So, so Derek, first and foremost, great to see you. Happy New Year. I am just on fire this morning, by the way. I can tell. Yeah, that's wonderful. We were chatting a little bit before and I, I knew right away that you know you'd have a lot of great insights to tell the, the audience about and just share your experience and as mentioned before a unique perspective from the real estate investing world but also having uh, like you said you know spent millions of dollars hiring contractors working on you know different builds and, and things like that it's, it'll give us a really unique way of looking at things and some experience that other you know contractors and builders may not have so tell us a bit about yourself and you know your businesses and your, your background? I'll tell the um, the more relevant, interesting story for the majority of your audience. You know, uh, here's the short version. I was born and raised in small town Saskatchewan, born in a mobile home park, climbed the corporate ladder, went to university, got a degree in Bachelor of Commerce and was climbing the wrong ladder, was doing very well, moved up very quickly with the jobs I was doing. Um, but I had a, you know, a crisis at about age 30 of just, you know, I was climbing the corporate ladder and things weren't going very well. And I just had lost a lost a little bit of direction and at that time I um you know where does any young 30 year old man turn to for spiritual and guidance on your future you turned to Oprah at that time and that was the year 2000 and on Oprah I saw Robert Kiyosaki rich dad poor dad on there and that just opened up an entire new world to me that after that reading of rich dad poor dad I went a different direction I started investing into real estate bought my first property uh, shortly after learning about that I took massive action and I've been doing this for 25, you know, coming on 25 years of being a real estate investor. Now for your audience, for relevancy, I'm not a contractor. I'm not a general contractor. I'm not a home builder. I'm not a handyman. As a matter of fact, a lot of your uh, people, your audience, there's an old saying in kind of that building world that either you're handy or you're handsome. When I go to a job site, unfortunately, I'm neither. And and I, I sit there and go, well, where do I kind of fit into this whole mix? I'm the kind of guy, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that buys the property. I work with incredible teams of general contractors right down from handymen all the way up to massive home builders. And I'm kind of the guy that uh, delivers capital to the project, delivers the people to the project and brings the project to completion at the end. So I would hazard a guess over 23 to 24 years of doing this, I probably have spent upwards of tens of millions of dollars with contractors and general contractors and handy people and all that kind of stuff. It's uh, so I have a very unique unique perspective to offer to your audience here today. Yeah, definitely. You know, the building and the contractors are an integral part of, of investing and, and seeing a project through and a big part of a, a team to um, to move projects forward. So yeah. without uh, them, like no, any... honestly, honestly, Derek, sorry to jump mm -hmm. over there for a second. Yeah, without them, nothing happens to be to be brutally honest. I, mm -hmm. I would I would be very lonely and I would have <laughs> I would be sitting here in my in my office sitting by myself if I did not have an entire team of people that are out there doing the work and you know and i know you and i are in beautiful sunny british columbia and coquitlam and and it, our, mm -hmm. our weather app said zero today and i'm just going <laughs> but where my projects are is in a little bit of alberta northern alberta and i saw it was like gonna get to minus 37 below <laughs> tonight and i i slowly wholeheartedly salute everybody that's in the trades and doing the work and out there making things happen and the productivity mm -hmm. that the construction construction industry does is just like second to none. As a matter of fact, we need to celebrate you more. We need more people in the trades. We need more people in construction. We need more people in general contract. We need more pe home builders because we are in such a housing shortage in this beautiful country of Canada. It just breaks my heart that we have so many gifts and benefits and stuff like that. And then somebody tells me as well, we have a we have a worker shortage and we're not be able to do stuff like that. It's just like breaks my heart. We need to celebrate. We need to in 
encourage more people to get into the trades and I'll get off my soapbox now here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. There's definitely a shortage of, you know, good quality trades workers and, and new guys coming up into the trades. And uh, it's so important and it's it's what built this country and who built this country and is definitely a big part of, of the ongoing growth of the nation. So um, super, super important. And I can uh, very closely relate with all the guys out there in the cold weather. Uh, I'm from Winnipeg, so I'm very used to framing in minus 40 degree weather with the snow blowing and uh, trying to move the arms around to keep the, the fingers warm and stuff like that. Wow. So I, I'm originally from Saskatchewan, so I mm. understand cold. And yeah. it's funny, a few years ago when I started mentioning that zero is cold and brewer, I had to turn my Saskatchewan card back in. They they are no longer <laughs> they no longer recognize me as Saskatchewanian. <laughs> yeah. So uh, like any you know seasoned professional in you know entrepreneur contracting or real estate, any business really, you know your biggest lessons learned are, are generally the biggest mistakes and challenges that you've had along the way. So can you share a few of your your, your big mistakes or challenges that, that you've gone through that you could shed some light on and maybe help um, you know other people sidetrack or, or be aware of it before you know maybe getting into those sorts of situations? Yeah, one hundred percent. And the the challenge that I'm going to share with your audience is probably the opposite of what most people think. Is truly is um, the challenge I bumped up against is I went way too fast, way too quick. I didn't backfill the proper people, the proper systems, the proper support. I didn't backfill any of that stuff. I, I literally left the, the starter's gate and ran way too fast out of the gate. And I, you know, don't get me wrong. We took massive amount of action. We added a whole pile of properties to the portfolio very quickly. We created a big giant dust storm behind and a big giant wake behind us. But at mm -hmm. the same time, I didn't backfill it and support it. And I didn't have good guidance and good coaching and good mentors and a good account ability to just check in with what was going on. Are we able to support this? Do we have the right team members? Do we have the right people on the bus? Do we have the right systems to track this? Do you have the right governance here? Do you have the right counting disciplines and rigors in place? And and sometimes when you go too fast, too quick, you come to that point where, you know, you you hit a hit a wall and a market might pivot and turn, you know, no different than what I would say is happening in BC and Ontario right now. But I was investing very heavily in Alberta. And we hit a, a we hit a very big roadblock that jumped in around the year 2007, 2008. And then after that, there was, you know, for a, a litany of different reasons, there was not much happening for a better part of more than a decade. And sometimes when you go too fast, too quick and don't back support all your business and all your operations and things like that, you very quickly identify where the weakness is lie in the um, process and I clearly identified where the weaknesses were and it was it was a, a painful few years it was a painful you know better part of eight to ten years in a lot of respects of just clean up and dealing with stuff that I, I shouldn't have bought we bought in the wrong areas and the wrong tenant profiles and bought the wrong properties and had to clean that up and about about four five years ago started to after getting through that cleanup of a lot of that to starting to rebuild again but be mindful and be diligent of the rebuild process to build with the right systems, build with the right people, build with the right rigors, build with the right operations in place. And I'm still, I'm not perfect. Operations for me is, uh, is sometimes a four letter word. I'm not the most, I'm not the best at it. It's not typically my lane, but that's where I, I lean upon other professionals to do what they do best. And no different than the, probably the majority of your uh, audience is, I rely upon the general contractors. I rely upon the home builders. I rely upon them to take care of a lot of those business operations on the job sites in the build in the build process. Yeah, super important. And I call it like the foundation of systems where if you don't have that foundation in place, you can only build so big before things start to fall apart and you have no more time in the day or no more hats that you can put on to wear. So getting that right, even though it seems like it's maybe slowing down your process, your your trajectory will be bigger and faster well, and a lot less, less painful. This is something your audience will very understand is you know when you're building something without a good solid foundation you've built a pile of pile of crap if you will right mm -hmm. um doesn't matter yeah. how beautiful the, the countertop is or doesn't mm -hmm. matter how beautiful the ensuite is if it's built on a on a crappy foundation with, that hasn't been uh properly irrigate uh, the water treatments everything hasn't been properly done you've got yourself a lemon of a property mm -hmm. and doesn't matter what the rest of it looks like you have to have that good foundation to start yeah and no different than than a business and getting your system set up so as you mentioned you know you've spent a lot of money you worked with a lot of different contractors 
built a lot of different you know properties and developments and things like that so what are some some techniques or systems that that you've used or implemented to to manage contractors manage projects yeah so so mainly the interesting answer of that is internally for me the systems to manage projects is is very simple like for me i i truly just keep a spreadsheet of things and that's really simple from from my standpoint but don't get me wrong there are incredible trello boards and detailed systems and stuff but that is handled by by my property management team the team people that manage the manage the tenants and manage the properties they manage an entire database of, of calls and connects and things like that and then also on the builders that i use they have an incredible system and i honestly i don't know to be totally honest i don't know their systems all i know is uh they deliver an incredible product at the end result and along the way when i if i need an update on something like that within a day they can provide me an update with exactly where things are exactly where things are at and then by the time my quantity server goes in to analyze the statements and analyze all the things and have their you know their big giant spreadsheets and stuff like that the building team is is literally on top of it so i rely upon the people that manage their business to tell me what's going on in many respects. And uh, for many of your um, audience, if you want to uh, really dive deep into exactly what I just talked about, there's a wonderful book written by Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy called Who Not How. And the key premise of that entire book is find key who's to manage and do what they do best. And you technically don't have to know all the hows to do. You just let the who's do what they do best and you give them the tools and resources they need and then get out of their way and then just let them do their job, right? Yeah, transition there in, in thinking and, and operating of, you know, business owners, we often start our businesses and it's like, how do I do this? How do I do that? And you kind of want to figure everything out instead of thinking who can do this well, or who think, can do Think about do this that. for a second is, so, so I'm the investor I'm buying the place. I'm going to eventually own it and rent it out after. The last thing my general contractor or my build team would want would be me sticking my nose into the line item and everything. Well, how many shingles did you put on that property? And what did you pay per shingle and stuff like that? Like some people get to that level. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't know. First of all, I don't know. Um, but also, mm. I, I don't have the time or capacity to really get to that level. What I, what I do is I know the end goal. I know the product I want to have. I know my tenant profile. I, I have the build plans. I have the design. Our entire design team puts all this stuff together, hands it off to a builder and says, can you quote us and build this product for us? You don't have to worry about any of the sales and any of the stuff. You give us a quote. If we use your quote, we'll write you a purchase contract right now before you even start building. We'll write you a purchase contract right now uh, with some conditions and all that kind of stuff. If you can build this for the price that you're going to tell us you're going to do. And here are the timelines. Here's the delivery point. Here's the 40% completion. Here's the 60. Here's the the timelines. And if you need me, I'll go get the financing. I'll go bring the capital. I'll bring you the land. I'll bring you the construction financing. And then I'll bring the completion finance as one strategy. There's multiple different ways we can do this. But at the same time, I would say uh, majority of my build teams don't want me to really be in their in their back pocket. That's that's why you, you hire professionals, right? That they know what that they're doing. You can and, and here's the thing is you can, and... you can clearly tell if somebody knows what they're doing and they're professional. And you may try somebody once and they might not be able to get their stuff together, then you might not use them again. But if they do the job, um, you know, I'm just referring to one of our build partners that we use right now, they're doing four, four build projects for us. And I have a feeling capacity that they have, they can probably deliver 30 or 40 houses for us. Now, if you're a builder, when you like to just work with one person or one team of people and know that you've got 40 homes that are going to be delivered on a 24 uh, every 12 months, you can have that many houses that are going to be delivered. And all you have to do is manage one relationship man sign me up definitely a good working partnership there for, for both yeah, it's, sides it's and uh, the relationship yeah. and the partnership 100 mm, yeah and i'm sure there's you know efficiencies and and a lot of stuff that goes along with working you know hand in hand with people that, that know what they're doing right the, the who not the how so there's a, a lot of contractors um, especially as they they grow and expand you know do look into real estate investing because they know how to do the renovation they know how to build the house they know how to do the building part of a project and then they want to get started in in real estate investing and you know maybe purchase purchase a house or purchase land 
what would your advice be to to a contractor who wants to look into getting um, started with, with real estate investing? Yeah, so the easiest advice I would give, and I will unpack this, is to just do it. Like, don't just build and construct, actually own, right? Now, and how to use this maybe as just a a side story. So if some of your GCs and some of your people listening to this and watching this actually look back and reflect it, especially if they've been in business for multiple years and maybe multiple generations, maybe they've been in business 20 years, 25 years, and they sit back and go, geez, if I actually owned a 10% ownership stake in all those projects or all those homes that I built, holy moly, I might not be in a position where I would ever have to be on a job site ever again in my life, ever. So I would strongly encourage everybody listening to this to really the simple term I would put it is make Make money strategies, which is your business, your active business, your GC, your contracting, your home building business that make money there. But at the same time, you also have to think about holding wealth, building your wealth, holding it into real estate at the same time. And there's ways that you can partner with people. And I'll tell a quick story about a couple of our home builders and how we partnered together on some of these projects. But you can e either you can just directly buy the place and you own it 100% yourself. And you just once a year, you buy one more place. And over a course of 20 years, you got a portfolio of 20 properties and you know Bob's your uncle or there's a way you potentially could partner with somebody that's doing a lot of this and you could uh, participate alongside them on a lot of their 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 properties as well so I'll give you two two stories of two people that I know on this on, on one of them is a build uh, a business and and here's the thing is sometimes the first step I would always coach and counsel people on is is what do you want your business to look like what do you want to provide it to you and in this case this person is they just wanted it to provide them for for 20 25 years and then after that period of time they would just you know right off in the sunset maybe sell the business off and then retire down in palm springs mexico whatever so what they did 20 some years ago was they partnered with a property management company. They partnered with a good realtor. And what they did was they became the preferred supplier for that property management company, for that realtor, for that business team. And honestly, they had no marketing costs. All they had to do is just manage one or two relationships. And they had more business than they possibly could shake a stick at just through this property management company that had, you know, three, 400 properties that, want, that they were looking after. Okay. And then what they made a pact of is every year we're going to take some of our profits off the table and we'll just go buy one more. We'll buy one house. We'll buy one property. We'll buy one property. And lo and behold, um, I talked to them a little while ago. They were, yeah, we're done. You know, we're 20 years in and we're now done. We're now selling the business off and we've got our real estate. We're going to sell off a third of the port properties. We're going to pay off the rest of the mortgage on the other two thirds. And uh, we've got enough passive cash flow income from the remaining properties that uh, we, we're we done. We're going to Hawaii. We're going to Mexico. We're going to go travel, right? So that's on one side. Mm -hmm. On the other side, let's say it's a, a home builder and this home builder is uh, doing very well and they can deliver, you know, 30, 40 properties a year. So what they'll go out there and they'll go, they'll go out and they'll identify land positions and they'll go actually go put a deposit on a piece of land and they'll tie up some land positions. And then what they'll do is they'll partner with an investor at the same time, like myself, I come in, they own the land. I will buy the land off of them as part of the build project and they'll mark it up by eight to 10%. So they make, you know, 30, 40, 50 grand right up front on the acquisition of that. And then I will get the construction financing and the completion financing. And I literally write them a contract before we even start the process. Then they can take that contract to the bank to get some financing if they need it, or I provide the financing for them. And literally they're, they're working with one investor that can deliver them um, through themselves or their partner network and deliver 20 or 30 homes a year. And they have to do none of the sales part of it, none of the marketing part of it, none of the, none of the uh, you know, having to get a realtor at the end to sell it. It's sold before they even start building it. And that home builder will essentially has guaranteed completions and has also made a little bit of money at the front on selling the land to the investor at the same time. And as the investor, I'm happy if somebody goes out and buys the land, if it makes sense, if it makes sense of the build project. And I will happy pay them a little premium for that because I'm exchanging their credit and their capital for me buying the place at the end. Mm. So just two examples, yeah. two different, two different uh, case scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, terrific positions to be in either one of them. A great advice that there are, I mean, those are just two, but there's so many different ways to get involved and uh, and different types of real estate investing they can do. It's not, not cut and dry at all. There's there's a lot of creativity yeah, there, in, in different, many different ways, avenues. Many, mm -hmm. many ways to slice the pie. And we even have one of our home builders that is extremely well funded that we identify, this is a good land position, this we want. They'll go buy the land. They'll actually fund the build and we write a completion contract that within eight to nine 
nine months after it's done, here's our price we will pay you. And they'll get paid at the end. They'll get a paid on a profit on the on, on their purchase of the land. They'll get a paid a profit on their build contract. And then at the end, they're guaranteed a, guaranteed a sale at the end. And all mm -hmm. I had to do as yeah. an investor was to analyze the property, hand over the design plans to the builder, go to my mortgage broker and take the time and painful process to get um, some completion financing on the completed project. And then when the project is completed, get the keys to hand over from construction, from builder to property manager to start the lease up. And then I own the property for the next seven, 10, 15 years going forward. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Perfect. So now for some, you know, honest uh, feedback and uh, learning for contractors, I'm sure you've kind of seen seen them all, you know, there's the good, the bad and the ugly and, and everything in between. What are some of your frustrations or opportunities for improvement that you've found working with contractors and the, the whole building process? Well, the obvious answer to all this, and it's something that every one of your listeners has heard probably 10,000 times. So just because it's obvious, it probably is true. It really is. It's the communication. It's just, it's a two-way street. It's if you communicate back and forth and you have a relationship with the person, I'm the investor and I'm not better or worse than anything else. You're the builder. You're my contractor. You do the work. You're doing all the work. We're both grateful. It's a symbiotic relationship and we're just both honest and transparent with it, each other. If crap comes up and stuff needs to be dealt with, um, let us know. And one of the biggest things that I, I've often said to the people that I continue to do business with are the ones up front. And I know this is probably a pain point for most construction companies because you're so busy and you got so many jobs and all you don't have time to do a really beautiful, detailed quote. The better the quote up front is that you present to me, the more quickly I will make a decision and I will use you going forward. If you give me just a, an off the cuff, well, yeah, it's going to be 1.37 million. I go, okay, for what? <laughs> but if you give me a detailed build plan and cost structure and all these kind of things and broken down into here's the, the reme remediation plan and here's the decommissioning plan and here's the build permit plan and here's the architect plan and here's all the numbers of doing that and it builds all up. I sit there and go, yeah, I'm, I'm in, right? The more detail, the more transparency we have up front, the greater mm -hmm. the chance we have of success and the greater the chance we have of coming to a conclusion if something is going off the rails, we'll, we'll hone in on something as opposed to just saying, yeah, we need another 40,000. Yeah, for what? Like, what do you need it for? Well, okay, let's go back to the decommissioning plan. Remember when we said we needed to do this for that? Yeah, our the cost to move that telephone pole on the back is now coming in at, at 80 grand as opposed to 60 grand that we put into the into the budget. So we need to revise that. Okay, got that. That's line 178 on the demo plan. Okay, got it. Let's revise that. Right. Yeah, yeah, good feedback there. And I know it's it can be seem tedious sometimes to, to yeah. get, go into those levels of detail, but oh, oh, I'm sorry, I, really just, I don't want to I'm, I'm, taking, I'm, the, I'm, taking the time <laughs> to generally pays yeah. off later on uh, when things like you said don't add up or things don't yeah. go exactly as to plan uh, it's all outlined ahead of time right yeah. but, uh, go ahead and then the other the other thing I would share too is um sorry just just came to my mind and I'm, I don't yeah. I'm, once I'm sorry I get excited and I start, I start going here mm -hmm. is is the following is uh, be open to listen and that goes both ways like for example um, sometimes some contracting some construction companies some home builders have just been doing something for so long that they're stuck in the way and it's the only way they know how to do it and stuff. Listen to feedback from the investor because the investor has their finger on the pulse of what the tenant or the home buyer wants and they're getting the feedback and that kind of stuff and they come back with suggestions to do something to to be open to some new new ideas and stuff like that. Here's a real life example. One of our home builders had in, in one of our areas that we build in just outside of Edmonton had a build project they were already doing. It was on three lots. They were building three townhomes and they had already bought the land. They were already doing the construction. They came to us and said, would you guys be interested in buying these three townhomes? So between myself and my my team, we looked at, we said, yeah, you know, not just as three townhomes. We wouldn't because it doesn't make sense for a long-term investor to hold that as a rental property going forward. We couldn't generate enough, rate, generate, generate enough rent to be able to make this make sense. Plus it didn't have enough units for us to be able to get commercial financing with the brand new CMHC um, build financing. Just didn't 
makes sense. But then we went back to the bylaws, went back to all the new changes and said, if you took that same build that you were already currently doing and they hadn't yet poured foundation, poured, you know, the bottom basement, they poured foundation, but they hadn't finished the basements or in that kind of stuff. However, if you went back and put in a suite into each of the outside, a lower unit suite into each of the outside units, and then a new bylaw change came out that is allowing us to put garage suites on the back where we're putting garage suites, put a two, two bedroom garage suites. So we took this from three units to seven units. The builder went back and priced it all out to do all that build, all that work. And we said, now that makes sense for us. Instead of buying three townhomes, we're buying three townhomes with seven rental suites. So then we were able to then take that, bundle it up, go get financing for it, wrote a contract at the new purchase price. So the builder took it from, let's just, I'm just going to use rough numbers. Maybe it was a $1.1 million build cost to a $1.8 million build cost and stuff like that. And now it made sense for us because we're able to own that as a rental property. And the builder just actually added on to something he was already doing and got paid more money for it. Yeah, that's a great uh, example of uh, working with an investor and, and how each, you know, those kind of relationships where each side is bringing something to the table. And because there is that communication back and forth, both get to benefit from it and both are able to do a project that makes sense um, and a larger project than than originally planned. So yeah, very important. And the thing with feedback too is always be appreciative of feedback, even if you think it's something you don't want to, you know, move forward with or whatever, but always be really appreciative of feedback because a lot of people don't necessarily give feedback and and you always want to have that door open that even if you don't have to act on everything people tell you obviously, but you always want to be appreciative because you never know who might provide some feedback that can really change something and yep. make your business better. And so great point there. And yeah, any any last, you know, bits of wisdom or knowledge or conversation points that you wanted to touch on? Yeah. So so the best thing I would advise for your audience is, um, you know, I know you're out there and you're busy in your profession and you're busy in your make money business. So this typically I said earlier, make money, build wealth. OK, so you're really you've taken the time and you've built out your business and you're generating cash flow you're generating income, you're generating surplus uh, spending capital, stuff like that. Take some time to take some of those proceeds to look to own, to invest. Don't just build own because I'll tell you what, if you actually take a look at any market, whatever market you're in, if you would have built a house in 1970 and you still would own it today, um, you know, you potentially in some markets, the market I'm in right here, you potentially could have an additional million dollars in your pocket, right? So don't just build don't just construct own at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Great point. Super important. And something I, I advise you know, my clients and people I talk with too is often we want to, you know, be successful in our business. So we funnel our money, all our attention, all our time into our business, but we never put those profits to work and invest them outside of the business to have, you know, that, that wealth building set aside for, you know, retirement, for uh, whatever, traveling, kids' education, whatever it may be, to build wealth on the side so that you never know what could happen with yourself or your business. So if something even did happen, and you've you've got that you know that investment side of your wealth that you can rely on and doesn't go away even if your business you know something happens in the economy or with yourself or your family or whatever so yeah and I, i'm gonna maybe offer a resource and i'll have to probably get you the link to this but it is on my youtube channel and my podcast channel it's essentially it's a, a framework on how somebody as a, an investor into real estate can generate a million dollar net worth and a hundred and eight thousand dollar income stream per year uh over 15 years by doing a program what I call 321 free. So it's 321 free. Buy three, mm -hmm. sell two, keep one free and clear. And over a period of 15 years or less, depending on the market conditions, you can have yourself a pretty tidy little portfolio that will outlive you and will be a legacy that you leave for family, everybody else. Wonderful. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely put a link to that uh, in the description of the video so people can go check it out and get, get the advice and, you know, long term thinking with the right plan so much as possible. So appreciate you coming on here, Russell, and uh, sharing with everybody. What's the best way for people to reach out to you if they want to connect with you or learn more about um, you know some of the things we've talked about today? Well, the, the simplest answer, so if you're watching this on video, I'm just putting something along the bottom on my screen, just all my social channels. And, and the simplest answer is if you Google my name, Russell Westcott, that's W-E-S-T-C-O-T-T -T, and Russell, two S's, two L's. If you Google that, you will find all the things that uh, about 
about what I do. Um, I've been spending an awful lot of time alone in the, in the studio here doing doing podcasting and uh, putting a, a show together. And, you know, I have a face for podcasting. So I, I've been enjoying that. My YouTube channel, I think, has more than 400 videos on it. If it's someplace that you want to really dive into. And then my just my personal name, RussellWestcott.com. It's kind of the hub of everything else around that. Perfect. So, yeah, we'll put some, some of those links in the description below. You can go click on them and uh, find out more and connect with Russell. Thanks again for coming on and thanks the audience for watching. Take care. Honored to serve. Thank you.